Well, a very warm welcome uh, to our book launch this evening of Black Gay, British Christian Queer, The Church and the Famine of Grace. Uh, my name is David. I'm the editor at SCM Press. I'm so looking forward to hearing uh, during this hour um, from the author of the book, uh, the Reverend Gerald Robinson Brown. Uh, Gerald is uh, currently uh, the assistant curate at St. Botolph Bot in Aldgate. He's also, uh, I think, completing an MA. Um, he should be here somewhere. Uh, we can ask him how the MA is coming on. Daryl, how's it going? Hey, David. Um, it's going all right. Ironically, um, the deadline is is about two or three days away, so I'm kind of trying to make sure it gets handed in. But I'll be very glad to not be spending my time mentally in the third <laughs> century. <laughs> <laughs> An intense time, I should think. Uh, we're also going to be hearing this evening uh, from our special guest uh, for the evening, uh, the Reverend Winnie uh, Varghis, who was formerly at uh, Trinity uh, Church Wall Street in New York, and she's just moved to become the rector at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Atlanta. Do we have uh, Winnie? There she is. <laughs> Winnie, that move, move must have been a bit of a logistical challenge, I should think. That's, that's some distance. I don't My US um, geography is pretty poor, but that seems like some distance. Yeah, there's nothing like moving in the middle of COVID. It's been an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so the way this evening is going to run um, is we're going to hear uh, from Gerald for about uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, sorry, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then he'll introduce us uh, to some of the themes of the book. Um, and we're going to then invite uh, Winnie Varghese into the conversation. Uh, and essentially, we just get to eavesdrop for a little bit on uh, what I'm sure is going to be a rich uh, uh, and exciting conversation between the two of them. There'll then be lots of uh, time, I hope, at the end, about 20 minutes, we'll try and leave for uh, questions and answers uh, as your questions uh, are brewing uh, while you hear what they say. Um, do do think uh, what they might be and uh, do uh, just post them into the comments section. If you look at your YouTube, uh, there should be a comments, live, live comments section, and, and we can pick up your questions from that. Um, and do tweet as well. We love to see a little bit of a Twitter buzz around a book. That's always fun. Um, unfortunately, hashtag Black Gay British Christian Queer is going to use most of your characters. Uh, so can I suggest that one there? There we are. Hashtag uh, BGBCQ, uh, which is uh, just a little bit less complicated. Um, so do uh, do use that if you have any questions. Uh, and also just to say the book is um, currently on offer. Uh, so if you uh, order it, uh, you can do so via our website, scmpress.co.uk. Uh, oh, in fact, uh, via the Church House Bookshop is the other good place. Uh, you see it scrolling at the bottom there, chbookshop.co.uk, and you can save £2 on the book. Uh, so do uh, check that out as well. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Gerald. Who is there somewhere, we hope. <laughs> have we lost him? We might have lost him. Well, let's, we could bring Winnie up instead. <laughs> there we are. I think we might have uh, we might have lost Gerald. Well, Winnie, do you want to give, um, you might be on mute, but if, do you want to give just a couple of sort of in instant reactions to the book? Because you've had a chance to read it. Um, you've had it for a little while in your hands. Um, Uh, maybe I'm getting better um, Wi-Fi connection here in uh, Georgia than, than in the UK. So one, this is just a, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's actually just a physically beautiful thing. Um, and uh, Jill and I will talk about this, um, but using the category of grace um, as a way to think about identity and um, systemic um, ways of thinking of what sin is and what it means to be um, human and Christian um, and of the delight um, of God, um, it's, a, it's just a it's a it's a literally beautiful way to imagine who we're supposed to be and who we can be in this time. Um, and I'll I, I won't say anything more about about that until we're in conversation, just so I don't give it away. Um, but it's it's worth a read. Um, it's accessible and scholarly and prayerful and spiritual, um, deeply theological. Um, highly recommend it. And I. I just had a power cut in my house and everything went off by and back. Wow. <laughs> um, are we good to go with me? Yes, okay. Sorry. 
Oh, dude, that's how things are sometimes. Everything went out. It was very bizarre. But I just thought I would um, start by speaking about this book and how it came together, um, and particularly about um, the bits in it that are really important to me and my thoughts. Um, what I want to do is just read from the preface, basically, and then talk a bit about some of the key themes for me. So this is from the preface. It's about a page and a half in, so I'll just read. As I started to write this book, the entire world began to change. The fragility of our human institutions and systems suddenly became as visible as their deadly potency. As our bodies became separated through physical distancing and human touch, restrained by lockdowns and isolation, we found ourselves facing an unseen killer. In the midst of this, the world we knew swiftly became unrecognizable, one in which we were told where to stand, how long to wash our hands for, and to cover the parts of our faces that we have retrospectively discovered communicate so much. We have experienced the very real double-edged sword of the necessity of touch and the abuse of touch evidence in rising cases of domestic violence, LGBTQ plus hate crimes, and multiple incidents of racist violence. This pandemic, or rather our response to it, has governed our intimacies, interrupted our spiritual life, and managed our funeral rites and, by extension, our grief. In the UK, it has silenced our singing, closed our churches, and rendered visible our societal sicknesses and inequalities at a time when Black LGBTQ plus youth have been hit the hardest. Writing this book about Black Christian LGBTQ plus lives at a time when the vulnerability of all black life has unavoidably shaped the tenor of my writing, has made a difficult task much more challenging. Not only has the absence of library access been a hindrance, but I have had to let go of how I imagine the entire process of writing. Between the higher rates of fatality among us throughout this pandemic, as well as the killing of Ahmad Arbery and Breonna Taylor, in the very public and brutal murder of our brother George Floyd in Minneapolis. I have tried to press on with a task that has, in light of this, felt even more urgent. Not just that, but this is a world in which race is now being discussed in a way in which, when I began writing in 2019, it simply wasn't being discussed in the UK. And I should add there, particularly not in the British church. The emotional toll of bearing witness to black LGBTQ plus Christian faith and trying to hear the voice of God in the midst of a writing task that has required the study of deeply tragic stories and our dramatic history has meant that the shape of this book has been determined by this experience. I say this to say that this is not perhaps the book I expected to write, but the book that these circumstances have given birth to. It is a book that speaks of the grace of God as God's special and unconditional love for all people and of how that grace is not offered as it should be to black LGBTQ plus people in the church of God. It is also a book that unapologetically centers black people as both the subject and the audience, although it seeks to challenge Christians of all backgrounds who are neither anti-racist nor LGBTQ plus affirming. For the first time in 800 years, churches in the UK have had to close their doors during this pandemic. In this period, I have heard Christians from all backgrounds, but particularly those of wealth and privilege, express their sadness and longing at the church turning its back on them, shutting the door just when we need the church most expressing in different ways a sense of betrayal. I've also heard of Christians expressing how they miss Holy Communion, really miss hymn singing, and miss the fellowship we normally have. Some have unequivocally told me that it is now more than ever that the church ought to be standing with the fearful and vulnerable. These multifarious articulations of sacramental hunger and embodied Christian community are things many privileged and heterosexual Christians are experiencing for the very first time. But I cannot help but notice that Black LGBTQ plus Christians have known this hunger and lived with it for years. That we who are Black 
and LGBTQ plus live constantly in a state of emergency. We know what it is to lose our spiritual home, be turned away from the church's sacraments and have the doors shut in our faces. We know what it is to lose a sense of spiritual family, to lose the safety and assurance that comes from being able to worship God in the way we once knew, to have routine and normality disrupted and to suddenly feel isolated. We know. And in our exile, from our families and from our spiritual homes, we have in so many cases not been sought out, but been left in a wilderness where grace is in famine and where love and welcome, sacraments and singing are scarce. Those who are experiencing this for the first time because of the pandemic should count themselves blessed that their exile is due to a virus and not their identity. When I first agreed to write this, I was determined to do one thing, write a book that did something to help set black queer Christians in Britain free. If I have achieved that, if I have in one way or the other pushed back against the violent religious, particularly Christian forces that make it difficult for us to breathe in this life, in this world, in this church, then I will rest in that knowledge alone and feel as though I have achieved something of the task I sought out to achieve in the beginning. So that sets, I think, for me, a bit of the scene in terms of um, where I wanted to go in this book. Whether I achieve that or not is for you to decide. Um, but one of the major issues, I think, with grace, and I think this book, this book is about grace and how that relates to Black queer lives. One of the major issues with grace is that because we speak about it so much as Christians, we all kind of think we know what we mean when we use the word grace. And I think we all think that we mean the same thing when we speak about grace. But grace has often been spoken about in a way which has framed it as that which transforms us. To be saved by grace is to become a new creation, is to be born again, is to be made new. That's lovely to a certain extent. But the problem is that so often when we speak about that in relation to black queer Christians, what we mean by that change, by that transformation, is that we are heterosexual, no longer queer, that we are white, no longer black or brown, and that we have to give up any radical politics if we have them. And so the first thing that I wanted to do was realise and write about the fact that I needed grace to do more for me than simply demand my transformation. Because if my transformation was about me becoming straight and becoming white, it was not a transformation that I was interested in, nor was it a transformation that was possible. And so I'm kind of challenged by some questions that James Cohn, um, that amazing African-American theologian, asks in his book, God of the Oppressed. And I take these questions and I apply them to black queer lives and think about grace using them. Cohn asked these questions. When does the church cease to be the church of Jesus Christ? When do the church's actions deny the faith that it verbalizes? And then Cohen goes on to say, for the sake of the mission of the church in the world, we must continually ask, what actions deny the truth disclosed in Jesus Christ? Where should the line be drawn? Can the church of Jesus Christ be racist and Christian at the same time? Can the church of Christ be politically, socially, and economically identified with the structures of oppression and also be a servant of Christ? Can the Church of Jesus Christ fail to make the liberation of the poor the centre of its message and work and still remain faithful to its Lord? And so I write on page nine, we might also ask, can the Church neglect the primacy of grace in its dealings with and relations to God's LGBTQ plus children and still be the church. The thing about what the church says to us in our baptism and in our confirmation is that when we think of what the church says liturgically and then we listen to what the church says about LGBTQ plus people, there is this massive chasm. 
And I suppose for me, and I'll close because we've lost some time because of this power cut, um, I'm really interested in what happens when we give a primacy to grace, when we let grace speak for itself, and when we don't connect grace constantly to the language of sin and repentance, what happens when we just think about grace as the unconditional love of God? And what I want to do in this book is to separate grace from just being a theory or a doctrine um, that is just about words um, and look at grace as the person of Jesus Christ. So what do we learn about grace when we look at the body of Christ, when we look at where Christ places his body physically in his life on earth? What do we learn about grace when we look at the wounds that are in Christ's hand and feet and side? What do we learn about grace when we listen to what Jesus has to say to those who were marginalized, condemned, oppressed, and, prejud prejud and who faced prejudice and discrimination in his time? Father Roger Haidt, a Roman Catholic theologian, says that everything that God does for humanity in Christ is grace. And that is what I'm working out of as a framework in this book. Um, and so that's just a way in to some of my thoughts that are underpinning um, most of the pages in Black, Gay, British, Christian, Queer, The Church and the Famine of Grace. Thank you. I think you're muted, David. Sorry. I am. <laughs> that's because I wasn't expecting to appear. But uh, but thank you so much. Um, that's given us a really uh, great insight into uh, it, it, into the book. And um, and I'd really recommend. Um, I mean that 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 sort of introduction gives a really great uh, sort of sense of where you come from. Um, but I think. Uh, I'd, obviously recommend reading the book um so so do uh, uh do check it out i'm hoping that um winnie is going to appear at some point ah she is there okay <laughs> great you don't need to hear from me anymore so uh winnie and gerald we're going to put you into conversation with each other and uh, and do remember as well um i'll just say as well uh that um the youtube chat feature is there for your questions so please do use that and uh, and we'll sort of gather gather questions at the end gerald thank you for um inviting me into this conversation so it's, it's a real privilege for me and um, thank you for speaking the names of so many Union Theological Seminary professors. Um, oh. It's like being back in school, so it's wonderful. Um, there's, so, there's so many things I want to ask you. So I'm, I'm going to start with this. This is a quote from you, right? Let me read some of your words to you. you Grace exists to make us more our true selves. When seen in this way, grace is that which should cause a downward move in us into the truest and deepest parts of our true selves, rather than an upward move that takes us out of ourselves. It is the thing that enables us to live completely and fully in our skin with comfort and pride. So I'll throw you a softball at first. Um, how do you come to believe that in a world and in a, in a faith that would tell us that in these bodies, um, that grace is actually something that would, either that's quite philosophical or that would take us very, it's something unachievable by us or, or it comes to us because of our profound um, sinful nature. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the moment you make the move um, from seeing grace as this kind of abstract theory to seeing it as embodied in the person of Christ, you know, one of the things that, that makes Jesus attractive to me is that he is himself. <laughs> um, and there's a sense in which Jesus is never apologizing for being him. And I find that really troubling and, and quite disturbing on one level because I don't have that kind of courage. And it's something that I see also in someone like James Baldwin, this complete unapologetic inhabiting of who they are. Um, and so therefore, when I look at grace as embodied, it demands that I bring my own body into that encounter. Um, and actually the, the thing that I think Jesus calls us to you know, come and follow me is not is not just about like walking in my shadow. Um, come and follow me. You know, the reason that the disciples are called to leave behind life as they knew it was because that was not that was not real life. There was there was a there was a deeper reality for them. 
Um, and they became their true selves as they learned what it meant to live in communion with Jesus, you know? And that's why they lay down their lives for him because they discover a deeper reality. And I think for me, there's something there that I, I realize is true for me, that actually there is a me, but then there's the me that, that I encounter in Christ, um, which is so much truer, but is, um, is a scarier place to inhabit. Um, and, and I think that downward move is about, you know, really getting into contact with who I am at the deepest level, um, which is the person I run from, but the person that God sees, you know? Um, and so I wear a mask so often. Um, that sounds so different in this time when we do wear masks for different reasons, but I, I wear a, a mask um, to cover my, my entire face you know, to be acceptable to so many people, but that's a mask that God never sees. Um, and I think the invitation to to receive grace and to live in grace is to live in such a way that we can drop that. And that's why grace is scary. And that's why grace is so important. So the the, the process you're describing, um, when you describe reading Dr. Cohn, you know, he talks about in his first book in writing Black Theology, that he he went away and um, went upstairs in his brother's house and wrote for months and months, like worked it out, right? That the the um, he literally had to go sit in a room alone to work out the idea of how black power could what it the challenge to the church that it was, because it was so outside of what how we learned theology, right? It was, it was bringing together categories that, um, that weren't brought together. Um, so I'm, I'm obsessed with this. I, I, I'll stop beating this drum for too long. But how, how'd you, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued by how we get there, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was just thinking that, that actually Dr. Cohn, the reason I am so um, in awe of him is because of that, that he, yeah. he lived that true, reality right he entered into that he he i mean he's, he's similar to some other theologians in some ways who perhaps i agree with in a in a different way or don't agree with so much but whose work i find challenging because they're asking questions i would never dare ask yeah right or that i would never ask publicly and the reason i find dr cohen so inspiring is because um he goes there into a place that we now because he's written his work know to be true in us but that actually at that time would have been so costly and so so daring and um, was genuinely new ground to say, this is the reality of black life. What does theology say to that and to own that? Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure his inspiration would have been Jesus, right? That that would have been one of his, his inspirations yeah. in doing that, that he felt so deeply the conviction that we find Christ in the theology that he was doing. You know, that he discovered a deeper truth about about the nature of God in his theology. Um, and once you discover that, you can't deny it. No. You know? So what I... It, this is part of the, the challenge that Cohn got as well, is the, the category of black freedom exists, right? As revolutionary as that was um, in the 50s or, you know, whenever. Um, but most of these movements for freedom, um, once you start to speak them, definitely true in the parts of the LGBTQI plus community I know, mm -hmm. um, leave faith behind yeah. because the, the categories cannot come together, right? Or, or we, we can't perceive them. I don't read that as ever being a struggle for you necessarily. Is that is that right? Definitely. I would say I haven't really ever experienced that sense of, of needing to leave behind my faith um, to feel freer or in, in kind of, in the struggle for liberation as someone who's back in Korea, I haven't had to leave my faith behind. What I have had to do, which is what lots of people have to do, and, and what I think I'm doing in the book to an extent for myself, is the process of, of deconstruction to a degree, you know? And, and for me, that also looks like reclamation. Yeah. I'm reclaiming um, my Christian heritage, our Christian heritage. And that for me is also about me freeing myself from some of the shackles of white theology, um, because actually a, a lot of what is my heritage has been taught to me as whiteness, um, as white theology. Um, so I've, I've, I've often felt as though 
there have been bits of faith which have been deeply um, controlling and deeply, um, you know, haven't given me freedom. But I've never felt this kind of complete contradiction. And I think it is because at the forefront of my mind is this person of Jesus Christ who embodies for me a faith that I can I can dig, I can buy. You know, I can buy into the faith that Jesus embodies. Um, and I've always had a separation, I think, between that and the faith that the church has taught as an institution. Um, but not everyone has that, you know. Yeah, so I um, I was listening to a friend, or I was trying to listen to a friend preach a sermon online recently, um, and she's from the Black Baptist tradition in in the U.S. And I had to I I expect I lost my mind. I, I for some reason thought it was going to be like an Anglican sermon, so I had booked like fifteen minutes or twenty minutes that I had free to watch this. And like twenty minutes in, she was still offering her thanks and acknowledgments of the people that had brought her there in that institution. That's a huge part of the the Black Church tradition. To, to name it, right? To name all of the links and the heritage and the people within the institution. And it's, it's a liturgical proclamation of a, a, a truth of, of the legacy of slavery and colonialism, that there are these parallel lives that we're living, right? Until I moved, my grandparents were on the wall behind me. Because if I could present my life to you on, you know, in my I would put my grandparents on the wall. Like this is this is who I come from and this is where my heart is and this is um, how I think theologically, frank, frankly, is framed first and foremost by by those people and their practice of faith. Mm. Um, again, I'm intrigued by what what causes you to bring that into theological and institutional church spaces for whom, at least for whom my family is, we don't exist. We're a part of the church that does not exist in the in the um, academic inquiry of the traditions that I come from. Mm. Um, what? So tell me about that. Tell me about bringing it in um, and what that's been like. Yeah, it's really funny. I was I was smiling because as you said that, I literally preached a sermon online for the Festival of Preaching the other day and started it off by telling a story about um, Graham Preedy, who taught me to preach, my first preaching mentor. Um, and, you know, he was a very holy man. He was a, he was so different to us and our family. So he's a white man from a middle class background in, in many ways. Um, and but his heart. You know, one of the things I always remember about Graham was that um, there had been some graffiti by the NF National Fund in our area. And I, I was not around when that incident happened, but my nan told me about it. And Graham made sure that that graffiti was taken away. You know, that was part of his... He, he felt so strongly about these things. He had a very clear moral compass. And I started that sermon by talking about Graham because I never come to anything alone. You know, I'm always mindful of those who have enabled me to be here. I don't, even doing this, writing the book, um, it was so important to me to call on the names of those who make my work and my life possible. Um, and so that has happened and, and will always be how I do things, to be honest. Um, but I think the main person that I would I would kind of call upon be, would be my grandmother. And, and she's fundamental in the sense that my understanding of grace comes from her. My understanding of God comes from her. I think a lot of my theological commitments in terms of my sacramentalism and so many other things come from her. Um, and she was an orphan um, in Jamaica. And so she didn't know her parents at all. She was adopted by a school teacher. Uh, and I think that that sense of rootlessness mm -hmm. meant that she found in God a sense of home. Um, and I had a similar experience not in quite the same way, but I was brought up by her because my father wasn't around and my mother has severe mental health um, issues. So my nan brought my sister and I up. Um, and I think she was recreating that sense of care that she knew. Um, and I think also I found a rootedness and a sense of home in God as well, because of that same sense of not having a place um, that was a safe, secure ground, you know? Um, and I was always taught that you, you know, we don't, we're not here on our own steam. We, we stand on the shoulders of many people, even if we can't name them, we have to be mindful of them um, because they're still around, yeah. you know? Yes, yes. And the um, another thing I'm struck by in your book, and um, Baldwin does this, Cohn does this, um, it, it seems to be very clear in your writing um, that it never occurs to you that God does not, wouldn't, that 
that you never question that God delights in you, that God has made you on purpose, um, and that you're beloved, beautiful. I mean, it's so, and you talk about Baldwin in this way. Right? For many of us, um, puts on paper what we know to be true, that there's this beautiful life here among beautiful people living, loving together. Um, so different, again, than how we are trained theologically. Um, so, to, again, tell me about, about bringing those together in, in, your, in your work. I suppose I am kind of building on my experience of love and grace that I discover and felt from my grandmother, right? And I and I I see that love and grace and care, um, that kind of nurturing, as also God's love and care for me. And I think you, I bring that into my theology, whereas actually um, the ways in which we're taught to do theology is that we're, we're meant to kind of leave our own experience of those things behind, yeah. and just go with what we're we're taught. Um, but that is not how I think we do theology. Like the, the the people in the community that we come from do theology differently. And actually that is the same way that the ancient thinkers of Christianity thought is that you bring the whole of yourself, um, your whole experience of God, not just in the church, but in the world, into your thinking and your writing, um, because that is also theological. Yeah. You know, God is the creator of everything. Why wouldn't you see God and experience and encounter God everywhere? Um, and so I think for me, I and, and Baldwin got that obviously, you know, um, it seemed to him completely nonsensical to divorce his reality as a black gay man living in America um, from his writing and from his spiritual experience, because you can't do that. You can't you can't compartmentalize God, which is why having to imagine that God despises your homosexuality or bisexuality or whatever it might be makes no sense you know because we experience the joy and love of god in our sexuality as well well it makes no sense except it's how we're all encouraged to think yes. that god lives in this very small box that lives inside your church exactly. and can only take certain things about you right um or understand certain things about you or see a very presentable version of yourself mm -hmm. um and it's still quite it's the revolution to say that that's not true I think God is active and alive in our worlds. Um, so tell me what you think about this. It, it almost seems that sometimes the pushback we get for this kind of theologizing um, has something to do with the fact that, that white Christianity has lost the category of freedom. Yeah. It doesn't get to have it because of white supremacy and colonialism in this history. And global majority folks haven't lost the category of freedom, mm. right? Um, so this is my own speculation. I'm you have much more training in this area than I do. Um, but because you're talking about grace for freedom, for freedom in Christ, right? Um, um, what, what do you think about that? And where does that take you? Well, I think I was just thinking, you know, I think one of the things about freedom is you only know it's cost when it's been taken from you, you know? And so, so freedom is worth everything because um, folk like us didn't always have it. You know, and actually that's that's so important, I think. Um, one of the things I'm going back to my nan again, but she used to say to me, we're coming from afar. She often used to say that. She used to call me Jaja and she'd call me and say, you know, we're, we're coming from afar. And as a kid, I used to think, what do you mean? You know, I was born here, I haven't come from far. What are you on about? And I used to think she meant Jamaica. Yeah. And I used to think that she meant, I don't know, somewhere else. But But she was basically saying, there's a degree to which we don't, you know, we weren't supposed to make it here. Yeah. You know, to actually remember that we were enslaved. Yeah. Remember that we've, we've come not just from a physical place, but through something, through an experience. Um, and I think that, that for me, means that freedom is, is so important. Not just freedom, but joy. Yeah. You know, and experiencing those at any cost. One of the things people sometimes say to me when... Um, if I, if I get very passionate about justice issues, which is the one thing that really does get me fired up, um, they don't get it. They're like, why, why, you know, that seems to really evoke something in you. I'm like, well, yeah, because actually um, people like me have died over yeah. this stuff. You know, this is not, this is not cultural war stuff. This is life and death, yeah. you know? And um, I think this is where there can be a divide even between, um, black and brown people in the LGBT community and white folk that actually there's this illusion often in white queer circles that everyone is free. Yeah. 
you know that we've, we've done the work on lgbt inclusion that the the only thing we need now is marriage and i'm like well equal marriage would be lovely but you know what i just want to breathe yeah. you know actually lots of black and brown queer folk just want to walk down the street um and not have the police harass them you know um and it, it is a different thing to inhabit a black body as someone who's black and queer than it is even in the uk as someone who's white and queer yeah, it was. Um, it got my attention to hear you say Ahmad Arbery's name. He, you know, he died here, um, wow. jogging, right? And um, part part of the the change in COVID times for us is not that more people are dying; it's that we can be bothered. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, which is, yeah. And as Christians, if we can't stay connected to that, I really don't. I don't know what we're doing, right? Well, that's <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but for me, there was a kind of sense of tragedy. A lot of people were saying, you know, isn't it wonderful that so many people are getting on board with kind of the anti racist stuff and, you know, that people are having these conversations more. And I remember when everyone was kind of saying the Black Lives Matter stuff, who had not said anything about it before. And all I was left with was a deep sense of grief, I think, that it took that, you know, that actually many of us were um, aware and had had a deep sensitivity to these issues for the whole of our lives. And some people had the privilege only in 2020 of becoming aware of this stuff. That didn't fill me with joy or gladness that people were becoming aware. It filled me with grief actually, yeah. you know? Um, and I still feel odd about that. You know, that actually the church is doing a lot now, particularly in the UK context, to talk about race that it wasn't before. And part of my sadness is that it took that. Yeah, yeah, that we're, we're, we're living such different lives right next to one another, right? Um, our, in, our insides. So you, um, to, to the point of coming from afar, um, your own theological work has taken you to, um, to the early church and origins um, and to the origins of, of Christianity as we know it um, in North Africa. Um, so tell us about that. Yeah, so I was taught church history um, by Angela Tilby in Cambridge, and, and she was an amazing lecturer and someone who made the kind of early church come alive for me. Um, but the one connection I had never made back then, this was 2010 to 2013, was that there were so many great thinkers who were Africans, and so who, um, who shared something of my identity and it's a really complicated one. I mean, you know, just to, to use the term African doesn't necessarily mean blackness. Then this is the thing. It means lots of things. Um, but one of the things that I would argue it does mean is a proximity to suffering. You know, I've, I've recently come to the conclusion, for me at least, um, that one of the things I mean when I use the term African in my scholarship is a proximity to martyrdom. You know, mm -hmm. one of the really fascinating things is one of the earliest records we have, in fact, the earliest record we have of Christianity in Africa is a record of facilitated martyrs in Carthage in 180 AD, um, which is incredible that that's the kind of beginning of um, the historical mm -hmm. of Christianity in Africa. Um, and so many of the great thinkers we think about live close to a, a suffering that is caused them by the empire. Um, and another beautiful thing about that is that there is a conscious turning away from that. They are martyrs because they refuse to play the empire's game. You know, they are struggling against imperial powers. They know what it means to follow Jesus Christ and therefore they won't do the empire's thing. Um, and one of the main thinkers for me in terms of this book was Athanasius of Alexandria, um, who is a fourth century church father. He's called the father um, of orthodoxy. And he writes an amazing work, a two-part work, but we know it as on the incarnation. And that is um, all about the image of God um, being, being seen in human beings. And um, one of the things that he says is that God created the universe, leaving nothing nothing barren of his image. Um, and so I take that and I think, well, that has to include the LGBTQ plus community. If God creates the world and nothing is barren of his image, how can it not include black queer folk? Um, so drawing on that resource was so important for me because it's our heritage, you know, and we who are black and queer who were told that um, we have no place within this this thing called the body of Christ. Um, if we look throughout the historical record, there are black queer Christians. Uh, you know, I promise folk they exist. 
we're not the first we won't be the last and so actually this is our home because we've always been here and often it's saying that which is so important um, when we face homophobia that says you can't be christian and queer you can't be black and queer um, this is our church because god made it our church well one of the um challenges I, in in your book is for the church to be a vehicle of grace to the world what i i have to say i having read other things i realize that i i think of grace as something that comes from god and kind of gets to you despite the church which is how i've worked around the fact that the church so often doesn't work but of, of course it would be our problem right of course um how who we distribute the sacrament to and who we offer it to and all that um I would love to know, I, I, um, I think we have to go to questions soon, but um, tell, tell us something about ho holding the church accountable um, in its responsibility in that way and its faithfulness. I think it's vital. I think, I think we, have to, we have to hold the church accountable because God holds it accountable. You know, one of the things I really get tired of is that as queer Christians, we are made to examine and scrutinize our lives to such a degree. And the church doesn't think it has to do the same thing about its institutional life. I'm like, no, actually, the gospel has something to say about all of our lives as individuals and as a collective. And so for me, I have no time for a church that says that queer people have to really take their sin seriously, more seriously than anyone else, you know? But the church can treat people any which way it likes, and somehow seems to think that God doesn't see that. Um, and I have a massive problem with that because I'm like, I, you know, we have to listen to the message that we proclaim and we have to hear it for our institutional lives as much as for the lives of those who are outside of the church. And my problem is often the gospel is kind of put out there and we don't look at the gospel and think, well, how much are we living it? How much does the church actually live what it proclaims? And so for me, when I talk about the abolition of the church, you know, I'm not talking about churches being smashed to pieces and, and torn away. Um, but I am saying that, you know, if, if we can't make this thing better, then some of it does have to go. And some of it we just have to let go of. And that's to do with hierarchy, it's to do with power, it's to do with privilege that I think cannot be reformed and cannot be redeemed because it was never meant to be there in the first place. Yeah. So I'm going to trust that if I'm supposed to go to questions, I'm going to disappear. And that's how I'll know. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Just waiting to see if David will join me. Oh, is. Thank you so much for that that discussion. Um, I, I actually I'm going to be really sneaking from my own question first. Sorry, Peter. We will come to your question in a minute. I I'm intrigued because um, when I first um, picked up the manuscript and and read, um, one thing that really stuck in my mind was that sense that of, of who you were writing for. And that sense that actually primarily as a white heterosexual male, you weren't primarily writing for me. Now, my experience of that was, was that it was um, um, it knocked me back to where I think I should be when I approach any book. Sure. Because I think, uh, you know, we've talked about theology being white and owned in that sense by as a white space. As somebody who, who who sits within that space, to be told immediately, this is theology, but it doesn't have you first and foremost in mind. Yeah. That was a, 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 something that sort of struck me. So I just wondered if you could unpack a little bit about why why you took that approach and why why that sort of was your your starting point. I think because um, I think I think that kind of assumption is something I've I wrestled with a lot and I've encountered in many spaces that the main audience is not going to be someone like me you know and i think i had just grown tired of that and i thought it's so taxing to have to do work and imagine an audience that's nothing like you you know and and there's so little I, there was nothing that i could find from a british context 
that had addressed these issues um, to to a black British queer Christian audience. And I know lots of black British queer people. And I thought, well, why why would I exert energy doing the mental gymnastics, mm-hmm. um, trying to write for an audience that isn't at the forefront of my mind? Yeah. Um, why not just get on with the task of writing? And I think that for me, there was a big freedom to that because the people who are like me um, will, will understand what I'm trying to say. I think that was really important just to free myself from that. And the other thing I had a lot of people say is um, there wasn't much of your own story in the book. I think the other thing that people assume is that you're going to you're going to put all of your pain and your suffering just out there, um, which happens in a lot of anti-racist books, and you're going to tell people how to be better people. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm not doing that either. Mm. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Um, so that, that's part of my thinking was it was too taxing, and I didn't see why I should have to do it in mm. 2020. Yeah. So I guess a, a, a connected question in a way from Peter Barrett. Um, how, how hopeful are you about the future? You know, we're, we're, we've made it to 2021 and we're still having these conversations. Do you, do you think it's ever going to be possible to breathe in the Church of England? He asks. Not as it is to the latter part of the question. Um, <laughs> no, because it is a church mired in whiteness and white supremacy. It is. I think without disestablishment, it's impossible for black bodies to breathe in the Church of England if they are part of the institution. Um, so maybe as a member of the laity, it might be possible. But I think the moment you transgress that boundary, um, you become part of a, a machine that has created no space for you in its mind. Um, and you know, let's not forget that the Church of England um, made a lot of money from slavery and that the, the the black bodies it had in mind when it was kind of at its apex were not free black bodies. It is important to remember that. Um, mm. And that's where some a church like the Methodist Church and the Church of England are different, you know. Um, and how hopeful am I about the future? Um, I'm really resting with this sense of hope at the moment and this, this um, desire for us to be hopeful. I think, I'm not sure that I'm hopeful or optimistic. I just have a trust um, that what we proclaim as Christians is true. You know, that Mm. Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. That's all I know. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if that makes me hopeful or optimistic. I just know that's true. Mm. I trust in that. Yeah. Rachel Starr's question here. Uh, I really valued your comment about being free to to be fully ourselves rather than uh, from a notion of sin or lack. How might we hear that in the church? Um, uh, Yeah, and her suggestion is to be converted to our truest shells. But do you want to just reflect on that a little bit? We we could bring in Winnie as well, um, just she might have some reflections as well. My first kind of thought on that is that I, I, I think to be converted to our truest selves, even the language of conversion I find difficult because there's a sense in which conversion, transformation, change is calling on you to leave behind a bit of you, right? We are, we are cohesive wholes. And I think that God, you know, one of the things I think I'm talking about in that is that one of the problems with the language around grace, conversion, change, transformation is you're, it almost speaks to that there's this day or moment when you become this new thing and you leave this old Thing behind and I think actually you know we all have a past it's good it's bad it's ugly all of that right but I do think God God was in it whatever it looked like and I'm really against this kind of any language that causes us to create a divide between different parts of ourselves um so I don't know if I would I think it's growing growing into the fullness of who we are it's probably the language I would use I don't know any if you I, if you would use that kind of language or how you would approach it but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think Rachel is a, a Methodist, so I, I won't pretend to, to know the in, insider language of Methodists. Um, but if, if there was anything to be converted from, I would say conversion, if it happens in our bodies in some way, or in our minds, would be, I would use the language of empire. So Walter Wink or William Stringfellow, that there's that the world defines us, right? Uh, more recently, we've heard, like the law defines us. Um, and part of what we're resisting and part of what the, we see in the ancient church 
It's people literally physically stepping out of the space of empire to try to, to hear Jesus, right? They, they, you got to go out to the desert and get away from it. Um, and I think that's, if there's anything that we should be trying to do, it's can we, can we strip away the kind of the notions of power and principalities and empire and get down to, to who we are? I would go with that completely. I think that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's bring on Claire Stevenson's question. Um, as she says, she's interested to learn more about your call to train to minister within the Church of England uh, and what you just mentioned there about transgressing that boundary. Yeah. What's what sort of, you're in an interesting place. It'd be interesting to sort of hear a bit more. Yeah, I think so. The interesting thing for me is that I, I was a Methodist minister for seven years, and so I had already been ordained um, before deciding to become an Anglican. And for me, um, it's a long story, but Methodism became an in, uninhabitable place, a place where I couldn't exercise um, my my vows that I had made at ordination. And so for me, there was a question around, well, if this relationship has fallen apart, um, simply because you're you, not for anything that you've done, but because of who you are, um, but you know that vocation to be true. How do you salvage what is true, and where do you exercise that? Um, and the the place that I felt through a process of discernment that was the the best place to exercise that vocation was within the Church of England. Um, but nowhere has ever felt like home. Methodism never felt completely like home. The Church of England won't feel completely like home. I think anyone who feels at home within their tradition is probably lying. <laughs> you know, um, we all, I think, love and hate our denominations um, for various reasons. But basically the call to minister in the Church of England was a continuation of a call that came much earlier to minister within Methodism. And I see it as one continuum really, not as a complete change. Um, but to transgress that boundary, yeah, I would, I would say it is um, a transgression because I feel like I'm in a space that had, had not Kind of imagined that someone like me would be in it particularly the context i'm in now so i'm i'm serving in a in a city church in the square mile in london um and i am one of two clergy of color full stipendary clergy of color in this area um, and this is a very interesting place to be you know it's, it's very different to other parts of the diocese to be in the city of london has its own dynamic and so you're very aware that you transgress the boundary because the space and all of the mechanisms that operate within that space tell you this <laughs> constantly. Um, and that's just an interesting dynamic to be within. Mm. Yeah. Uh, this might be a question that you can both uh, reflect on. Um, the, the, the term sin, what does it include, exclude? Do we define or redefine the term? Have we mis misused, misunderstood the term as well, I guess? To your last point, yes, <laughs> David, at least for that last edition, yes, we have, we have misused it. Um, you know, I would really go back to looking at Jesus, right? And, and to say that the things that Jesus gets most worked up about is to go back to what Winnie was, was mentioning, is to do with that stuff around empire, is to do with, with, you know, where your heart really is. You know, Jesus has lots to say about sin in many ways, but the stuff that really gets Jesus worked up um, is about that that allegiance to structures of oppression and injustice um and i think that, that for me the term sin has to include anything that causes other people to suffer um anything that that diminishes the image of god in another person um that has to be the primary thing and i think we need to we need to talk more about structures of sin as opposed to the sinful people because the problem is we've done that for so long and the lens has all, all, you know, always been focused on particular people, women, people of colour, um, queer folk, you know. We very rarely, if ever, turned that lens of focus around and looked at the structures that oppress those people who are most vulnerable. And I think surely it's time to do that now in a world where actually those structures have so much power um, and freedom and, and the time in which the church is completely complicit in those structures um, and almost manifesting and mirroring them. We need to put you on the spot. Do you have anything to add to that one? 
You know, I think so. I'm I'm I live in the American South now, and you know, not that different than New York, but faces the reality of racism in a different way than New York would. And you know, it's a it's a good reminder for all of us. Those are good Christian people filling their churches, pledging um, in line with their bishops the <laughs> the entire time of of enslavement in this country and post enslavement and Jim Crow and civil rights era. Um, good Christian people that are um, whose pictures are on the wall of the church I serve. Um, so I, I think sin is, I think we should think really carefully about who sin is applied to exactly as you've said. Um, and again, I think we 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 are bound by, and I, I use the word law a lot because I think it helps people to understand a little bit more concretely than what empire is. Like the way, the, like it, an example would be here in Georgia, um, we keep hearing about crime and how we need more police because there's just so much crime. And it means one thing. You don't have to get very far beneath it to know what that means. It means you're allowed to be scared of black and brown people on the street. And we need more police to protect us from that. That's the legacy of hundreds of years of conversation in this country about what is sin, what is evil, what is allowed to be punished, imprisoned. Um, so I, I think it, you know, it's a great question because it, 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 it is burdened by the legacy of empire. It doesn't mean that we can't cause harm individually and that we we want to be good. We should do, you know, but but even that notion of goodness um, yeah, gets wrapped yeah. up in, in some things that I don't know that Jesus would have had anything to do with, right? We need to just maybe think about the fact that actually if we if we define sin, we also have to think about defining its opposite, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I would say that one of the things, you know, I'm sure we've all met people that we would describe as holy. And I bet that one of the things that we, one of the reasons we call them holy or feel that holiness it's because they're deeply honest, that they're people who are actually so deeply themselves that their holiness comes out of them. And I would perhaps want to define sin as dishonesty at the deepest level, right? We're, we're dishonest to ourselves, we're dishonest to God, we're dishonest to each other. And one of the things I think to go back to the very beginning that Christ calls us to is to holiness, which is about being ourselves on the deepest level, to being as real as we can be, which is about vulnerability. Um, and not about power, it's about the very opposite. I want to bring in just this very last question and uh, ask you, put you on the spot and ask you to reply really quickly because we have got to uh, end here. But um, Alan Wilson's just reflecting here that um, that we, uh, the Church of England is, is afraid of the body um, and reduce the gospel to a mere idea or dogma and asks, how can it recover its grasp on Jesus' embodied grace? And uh, that is not a question you can answer in 30 seconds, but... Uh... <laughs> um, one of the things I say in the book is that we need to look at God as God is revealed in Jesus, and we need to look at Jesus as Jesus reveals himself, um, not as we imagine Jesus. And I think that has to be the first step in, in recovering its grasp on Jesus as embodied grace, as we... We can't recover um, the embodied grace that we need to recover if we're looking for Jesus that doesn't exist. And, and this is part of the issue, I think, that the, the church has subjected itself to a myth almost, a Jesus that doesn't exist. And so everything is affected by that, you know? And that's to do with gender, that's to do with race, that's to do with sexuality, it's everything. Um, you know, we need to look at Jesus as, as Jesus is. You know, we need to recover his Jewishness we need to recover Jesus's brown body. We need to recover the Jesus that is troublesome, politically radical, <laughs> not a Jesus that would be at home in most of the churches mm. that I know. Um, a Jesus that would have a lot to say to me that I wouldn't want to hear. That's got to be the first step in how in how we recover that sense of embodied growth. Winnie, do you want to add anything to that? It was one of my friends used to say, if it's respectable, it probably doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of that um, image in the Gospels of the disciples looking up uh, as Jesus has ascended and, and, and the sense of actually, you know, why are you still looking up? And uh, yeah. um, so we need to end it there. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time, amazingly. So I want to say a very big thank you to uh, to Winnie uh, for being with us uh, and giving up her time uh, to join in the conversation. We've loved having you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, and to Gerald, of course, um, not only for being with us tonight, but um, 
for uh, gifting us with um, this incredibly moving and an important book. Really, I I, I read um, through the book. I ha it's the nature of my job that I read. I get the the privilege of reading through a couple of times, uh, and and each time I've read it, I've been uh, moved and also um, sort of astonished by your your vision of of what grace is. Um, and also by this sense of bringing the whole of yourself to your theology. One of the things Willie said earlier was about um, that, that our theology sitting in a box, um, you know, and, and this idea that actually God is active and alive outside of that box. And I think that that sort of really resonates. So thank you so much. It's been a gift of a book um, to read. and It's been a gift of a book for me to, to, to work on as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so we do uh, just need to close there, but I did want to give you um, a quick uh, date for your diaries um, because if you've enjoyed this conversation you might like to know that on the 21st of October at 7pm um, that's UK time uh, we're going to be holding an online conversation between um, two recent authors Thea, Co Thea Cooper who recently published Queer and Indecent which is the theology of Marcella Althus Reed and Natalie Wig Stevens uh, whose book Transgressive Devotion has been making um, a few ways recently um, we're going to get them together in a room a virtual room and we're just going to get them chatting a little bit about transgressive theology queer theology and uh, in a sort of author meets author thing so do check that out at, uh, follow our twitter um uh, which is at sem underscore press um if you missed some of this conversation um because of, of links not working and so on we uh, the, the conversation isn't going anywhere it's stay on youtube um so we will be able to you'll be able to get um a, a look at the rest of the conversation uh, and i really recommend you do because it's been a really rich and and, and fruitful and um and uh, provocative conversation which i've really enjoyed so uh, i think that's about it for now thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, and goodbye <laughs>